Pleasure to be with you again. This is the second in a short series on responding faithfully to our civilizational moment. Last time I was picking up the notion of answering the call of Jesus, and this time I want to pick up the notion of serving God's purpose in our time. I was prompted to think about this some years ago when I was returning from Brussels to London on the Eurostar. As the train comes into St Pancras Station, you pass a series of very dilapidated Victorian buildings splattered with graffiti. And on one of them, you can see this. You only live once and it doesn't last. So live it up, drink it down, laugh it off, burn it at both ends. You can't take it with you. You only live once. Now you'll recognize that, of course, as the ill-fated YOLO philosophy. You only live once, which went through many of our campuses briefly some years ago. It's a kind of bastard version of Epicurus, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. But those who followed the YOLO philosophy forgot the original formulation, or certainly one of them, you only live once if then. In other words, life is short, life is brief, life is vulnerable, and many people don't make the most of it. Now, many of us have been reminded of that with the coronavirus pandemic recently. Everybody knows the opening verses of Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. 38 times that word in the book, five times in the second verse alone. But actually the Hebrew is not vanity in the sense of futility, meaninglessness, and so on. The word actually means short breath. So you could translate it short, short breath, short, short breath. Life is but a short, short breath. Now, psychiatrists point out to us that almost unawares, people pass through two stages in their lives that they ought to be more aware of, but most of us aren't. One is the moment when we say, very young, I am I. If that's underdeveloped, People have separation anxiety. They're afraid to be themselves. If that's overdeveloped, you have narcissists. I am I and who but I? The other moment that people are aware of, often half consciously, is the moment when we say to ourselves much later in life, I am I and I won't be here forever. In other words, the moment's coming when we won't be here. And not long after that, there's a moment coming when almost nobody on planet Earth will actually know that we've been here. So what on earth does life mean in the light of things like that? And how do we so live to make the most of it? Now, time is actually a mystery. There are some things about time that are easy to see. We occupy space exclusively, but not time. The Greeks love the story of the time that Alexander the Great, the conqueror, visited the crusty old philosopher Diogenes, and he said to him rather condescendingly, what can I do for you? And the crusty old philosopher looked at him and said, get out of my sunlight. We can occupy space exclusively, but not time. Equally, we can conquer space. Mobile phones, bulldozers, jet airplanes, we can conquer space. We can get anywhere in the world now within a day or so. But we can't conquer time. And time, along with evil, is a mystery to us as humans. We're so in it, 
we hardly fully understand it. St. Augustine said very famously, when no one asked him what time was, he could explain it simply and easily. But as soon as he was asked to explain it, he couldn't put it in words. It's a mystery along with evil, but we're living in it. And I would raise a number of questions to all of us to really challenge us to think it through in order to, how do we really know we're making the most of our lives, which are so short? First question for all of us, are we leading what Socrates called an examined life? In other words, are we thinking enough and caring enough to think through the meaning of life and our small part in it. You know, Socrates is right. The unexamined life is not worth living. There are millions of people, including many people in universities, who are leading lives not worth living. They have never cared enough to think about it. Now, that's really quite extraordinary. Why haven't they? Well, there are three answers generally given. One is what Blaise Pascal, the great Christian philosopher, physicist, scientist, and so on, what Pascal called diversion. The end of all of our lives is death. But we don't want to think about death. So we surround ourselves with busy, entertaining distractions, what he called diversions. And then if we have enough diversions, we really don't have to think. We can put off the whole notion. You think of our world of mobile phones and gadgets and video games, etc., etc. These have been described as weapons of mass distraction. And so many people are into all these things today. They're not thinking about life at all. The second reason people don't think is what's called bargaining. I'll do it later. Uh, when, when I've graduated, uh, when I've paid off the mortgage, my kids are a little older. Uh, when I've retired and got some time to think and read, I'll, it's always later, 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 later. And of course, finally, there's no more laters. And in our Western literature, that is the figure of the Faust person. The person who wants to bargain eventually wants more experience, more knowledge, more power. And so they bargain their souls with the devil, to get a little more time. But of course, in all of Faust's stories, the devil has read the small print and Faust hasn't. And we know the story of our Lord told us of the man who was building bigger and bigger barns until the Lord said to him, you fool, tonight, your soul's required of you. Diversion and bargaining are the two main reasons people think, but we should commit ourselves before the Lord to think through the meaning of our life in the light of the shortness. Second question, have we faced up to our own mortality? I was born in China. At one stage when I was very young, we were caught in a famine between three armies. And in this terrible famine, five million died in three months, including my two brothers. So I grew up with a sense, death, destruction, war, plague, cannibalism all around me. And I used to think, why not me? I lived and they didn't. You may know the story of Dostoevsky. He was a member of a dissident group arrested by the Tsar in the 1840s, put in jail for a year in the fortress of St. Paul and St. Peter, and then condemned to death. Tied to a post, blindfolded, the drums rolled and he thought the shots would ring out, and the Tsar gave him mercy, not as an act of mercy, but as an act of psychological terror. And all his life, he lived in the light 
of how close he'd been to death. His great contemporary, Leo Tolstoy, very, very different, enormously wealthy, the best known writer in the world, 14 children, happily married. But then he began to realize what the end of life would mean. And one of his characters says, what if my whole life has been wrong? And Tolstoy himself writes in his diary, what meaning is there in my life that will outlast the inevitability of my death? Or take a third question. Do we appreciate the difference between our resume self and our eulogy self? I'm using David Brooks's terms. You may know the story of uh, Alfred Nobel, after whom we named the Peace Prizes and the Literary Prizes and so on. In the late 19th century, he was in South Africa, and to his horror, he opened his newspaper and read his own obituary. The newspaper had actually got it wrong. It was his brother Ludwig who died, but he read, the merchant of death is dead. The man who made his fortune, it was through gunpowder, knowing how to kill more people faster than ever before, died yesterday. And he read what people thought of him. And he was so horrified by it, he changed the rest of his life and eventually left more than 90% of his fortune to what we know as the Nobel Prizes. But let me go on to a fourth and far more important question than these. Are we living with the full richness of the biblical view of time? Time is one of these areas where the Bible, for us who are Jews and Christians, is so different from the other faiths and philosophies around us. The big three are these. You have the Eastern religions, Buddhism, Hinduism. You have the secularist worldviews, and you have the Bible. And what are the three views they give us? Well, the Eastern view, in one word, is cyclical. Now, obviously, there are cycles in nature and in history. Spring, summer, fall, winter. We ourselves are born, we grow, we mature, we die. There are cycles. But the East has projected those cycles onto the very universe itself with notions like reincarnation and so on. So you don't have a very important view of things like history, or as I said in the first talk, or on individuality, the cyclical view, which doesn't give you a high view of humanity or history. The biblical view is what's called covenantal. Time is going somewhere under the Lord. The Lord has his providence and sovereignty over the whole of history. And as we come to know him, we become, as it were, what C.S. Lewis calls sub-creators, not creators, but sub-creators. We are junior partners and with trust and obedience acting into the world in a hundred different ways, we're serving God's purpose in our generation. And that's why it's called the covenantal view of history. The third view is the atheist view or the secularist view, which is simply called chronological. There's no significance in history or time. If you want significance, you've got to do it yourself, as I said last time. All you have is the chronological time. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. You have writers like Samuel Beckett, who saw that that view of time just cuts us into a thousand shreds. One of his plays, you have an old man, Crap's Last Tape. He's listening to tapes when he was in his 20s and 30s, and now he's in his 60s, and time has just shattered him in a hundred fragments. There's no continuity. There's no identity. He is only who he is in that second of time. Compare that with the richness of the biblical view. 
Time has meaning because history is going somewhere under our Lord. Freedom means that the future is never fixed or determined by the past. Have you ever thought of the wonderful link between forgiveness and freedom? Unlike karma or modern views of determinism, things we've done under the Lord can be forgiven so the past is gone. And the future is opened up as a future of freedom and a second chance. Or you can say again that for us, life may be incomplete, but it's never meaningless. Moses was called to lead his people to the promised land. He never made it and just saw it from the mountaintop across the river. But what we see in chapters like Hebrews 11 is that those who live by faith were acting into history, but we're looking over the edge of history beyond our lives, and we can see beyond the horizon by faith. And Hebrews says that God is not ashamed of people who have vision and live by faith like that, and he has a city prepared for them. So, yes, we'll face setbacks, disappointments, life may be incomplete, there are things we each long to do, would love to see, and we may not have the privilege of seeing in our lives if they're cut short. But by faith, trusting and obeying and looking over the edge of history and looking to our Lord, even what's incomplete to us one day will be completely fulfilled. I love the biblical view of time. Because you can see if you start to think of your notion of calling, and then add to it the biblical view of time. For example, the men of David in 1 Chronicles, who were skilled in reading the signs of the times to know what course Israel should follow. They weren't just pundits able to comment brilliantly on this and that. No, they read the signs of the times to know what they should be doing. And our Lord rebukes his generation. You know how to read the weather, but you don't read the signs of the times. And our Lord weeps over Jerusalem, as one of the versions puts it, all because you missed God's moment when it came. So we should be people who are under the Lord, looking out on our world, seeing everything under the perspective of heaven, and in the light of the perspective of the kingdom of God. So we're not looking at things in terms of our nation or politics or our economic interests or whatever. These things all matter in their place, but we're looking at them under heaven and in the light of the kingdom. And then by God's grace, trying to read the signs of the times. But that leads to something even deeper. I love the little verse in Acts 13, verse 36. Almost a little throwaway line. Paul is giving a great sermon on our Lord, and he comes to the climax where he compares Jesus and King David. And the little throwaway line he says is, David, after he'd served God's purpose in his generation, fell asleep. I love that. He served a strategic task, serving God's purpose in his generation. And when he'd done it, he died, he fell asleep. And I love the fact the early church, often at funerals, they didn't just say goodbye. What they said was, good night, sister, or good night, brother, because someone had put their head on the pillow at the end of life and was waking to be with the Lord. But that challenge we can't all shape history. Only the Lord can do that. But as we follow our callings with a sense of time, then we're serving God's purpose in our generation. But there's an even deeper level to me. And I confess, I'm standing on tiptoe and I'm stretching to try and understand it. I may not have got it quite right. Twice 
St. Paul talks to Christians about redeeming the time in Ephesians and Colossians. Now, most of our versions understand that term in terms of time and motion. You know Frederick Taylor's ideas that came in in the 19th century, time and motion studies, making everything calculating, efficient, and so on. So you have someone like Henry Ford with the rise of Ford Motors. I give them every second they need to make a car and not a second they don't need. You've got to pack every second in time and motion. No, no, no. And a lot of the versions translate redeeming the time by that. But the commentators point out the word redeeming, redeeming the time, is the same word used of Jesus on the cross, buying us back from sin and death. Equally, the word time is not chronos, that tick-tock, tick-tock succession of moments. The word is kairos, the significance of a moment, its opportunity, its challenge, its crisis, pregnant with meaning. So you seize it at the flood, as Shakespeare put it, to make the most of it. And we're called to redeem the time. I confess, I don't fully know what that means. But surely it means that if we're fulfilling our calling and we're doing so in the light of our understanding of the generation we're living in, then in some extraordinary way, the people of God, trusting him, obeying him, following him in this extraordinary moment, are redeeming the time. We know how evil the times are, corruption, decadence, perversity. And as we are faithful in such a time, by God's grace in ways we may not fully understand, we are called to redeem the time. So think of your calling. Follow me. All that you are in answer to all that he calls you to be. But add to that this notion of understanding time and the times in which we live. And as I began the series, we are at a civilizational moment of incredible importance. And it's a moment for Christians to stand up and speak out with courage. The Lord be with you. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you like the content that you receive from this channel, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Also, give us a thumbs up and share our content with all of your friends and family. It really helps us out. We also invite you to consider partnering with us. We're a nonprofit ministry with a mission to awaken the world to the power of the gospel. If you'd like to help us continue creating content, consider giving at the link on the screen or text the word donation to 21,000. If you want even more of our spirit-filled content, consider a subscription to globalondemand.tv, our subscription video platform. Thanks for watching.